So friends, again, this is a celebration of Vivekananda, and uh, as a pioneer of interfaith dialogue, our next uh, portion of the program is going to be an interfaith panel. We're going to remain seated in our chairs until we're called forth, and this is called Swami Vivekananda and the Harmony of Religions. Dr. Robert Hunt, Director of Global the Theological Education mm -hmm. at the Perkins School of Theology, will be our moderator. <coughs> Dr. Hunt will say a few words about the relevance of interfaith dialogue, and he, he will then introduce the members of the Dallas Interspiritual Dialogue that was co-founded by the Banana Society here. Dr. Hunt. First of all, let me congratulate you very much on this new center. It's beautiful. I can't wait to come back to it for other events. It's, it's great. I'm, I'm going to do three things. Um, first of all, I'm going to apologize in advance to those of you who are coming early. I have another interfaith event in Plano that I have to go through. So, it's my apologies that I can't be here for lunch. And believe me, I deeply feel that loss. <laughs> the second thing is to say how grateful I am to Bob Cron for inviting me to participate in this. And also to all of the members of the panel that will be speaking today. I'm sorry I don't want to hear all of you speak. But, um, I think we're all old friends. So I'd like to think that I know what she's going to say. But the third thing, I guess I have for you. The third thing is to briefly send uh, greetings from Rabbi Heidi Koretz, a colleague of mine who works with students at SMU. Rabbi Koretz regrets that she cannot be here. But of course, like all of you, sends not only greetings for the uh, opening of this center, but her deep appreciation for the work of the Kananda himself in founding interfaith dialogue or as a founding figure in interfaith dialogue. And then that would be the last thing I want to touch on at a little more length, uh, if you don't mind. Um, the time in which uh, the Vedanta movement was being formed in India was a time in which there was an enormous fascination with the fact in the West with the fact of the multiplicity of religions. And if we look into the late 19th century, we see that there's a number of Western writers, some looking in China, some in India, some working as anthropologists in Latin America or in Africa, who are trying to figure out what it means that there are many different religions in this world. And that many of them are civilizational religions. They're not just what we would then call primal or primitive religions. These religions are in great civilizations. And one of the characteristics, however, and I think I've read most of these works, Farquhar's Great Light in the East, Timothy Richard's work on Buddhism, but almost all of these works try to frame the existence of other religions in specifically Western and Christian terms. So they're trying to, they're trying to look in our framework and figure out how do we get everybody else in. And then something actually quite revolutionary happens at the part of the world's religions. When Vivekananda comes in, and enters that conversation talking about what it means to be engaged in a group of civilizations and religions, but now looking at that and bringing resources from Indian thought, from the thought that comes around, arises in the subcontinent, and which is often called Hinduism, that really represents a much greater diversity than a single word can represent. And that really does change the conversation. It's no longer a conversation between Westerners thinking about what to do with all these other people. It's a conversation among people trying to figure out how to be together in dialogue together. And Vivekananda brings such energy to Parliament and is such a towering and charismatic figure in the Parliament that it really breaks that conversation open. And it changes the way it's going to be done from that point onward. It changes the way in which a religious dialogue will look. I'm not going to say that there's not some vestiges of old Western colonialism and imperialism in our dialogue. It certainly happens. But Vivekananda really made Westerners aware that you're not just looking out and figuring out how to fit people into your system. We're engaged in a dialogue between different systems of thoughts, different ideas, and a growing and broader and broader and more universal understanding of what it means to be a human being. I think that is the pioneering work of Vivekananda, or at least one of the pioneering works of and one of the ones that has the longest standing effect. And whenever I, I look at something that says, when we enter into dialogue, we all ought to be equal partners, bringing our own integrity and our thoughts, I think
think about the fact that this is something that Vivekananda really, I think it's fair to say, forces through his charisma the rest of us to do. To take seriously the there are other ways of looking at the world. For that, I'm very grateful historically. I'm very happy to be here for this appreciation. I don't want to take away from any of the other members. I'm going to read their names. I don't think we need to jump back and forth. And then each will come up in their turn. So first, uh, uh, Helen Cortez will speak for my colleague, Dr. Ruben Javito. Um, I'm very appreciative of that. I'm sorry that Ruben could not be here. I know he's off on a retreat, I think. Yeah. Um, so he's being quiet right now, and I think that's probably it. Um, <laughs> Dr. Ruben, he talked to me a long time yesterday, so I'm, I'm on his side. Um, Dr. Hin Chara, an old friend representing the uh, Muslim community, Reverend Sherry Shanks. We've met before. Rabbi Koretz, I said, this unfortunately cannot be here. Bob Stewart, an old colleague in dialogue and doing terrific work. And then, of course, finally, Prabhrajika, Prana. If I don't hear you speak, Prana, you know I will be back for tea as long as you serve. <laughs> and back to be part of this community as often as I can. Thank you very much. And I'll ask for Helen Cortez to come forward. Thank you. Dear friends, it is a great honor and joy to be invited to participate in this auspicious occasion of the inauguration of the newly constructed Vivekananda Hall and the Ganga Center Complex. With apologies for not being able to join in person, I send you my heartfelt good wishes and greetings with my celebratory reflections on the significance of the Ganga Center and on Sri Vivekananda's contribution to the harmony of religions in the world, read by Helen Cortez, my associate and fellow Zen teacher of the Maria Canon Zen Center here in Dallas, Texas. First, I would like to convey my profound thanks to Venerable Sister Ramaprana for the gift of her presence in our Dallas Fort Worth area and opening a center here for her religious practice and teaching as the founding and resident, resident teacher guiding the Ramakrishna Vedanta Society of North Dallas. It is indeed a great blessing for all of us across the different religious traditions and communities we represent that Sister Ramaprana is in our midst. She has made herself available to give lectures, offer retreats and speak at panels and symposia on interfaith themes. Representing her tradition, and for this, she is a valuable contributor to the cause of harmonious interfaith relations in the Dallas Fort Worth area. I would also like to give special thanks for the initiating and hosting an inter spiritual dialogue group that has been going on now on a regular basis for two or three years, whereby spiritual practitioners and teachers representing Abrahamic traditions, as well as Dharmic traditions, gather and share time in a contemporary practice and deep dialogue on matters relating to the spiritual path. It is a privilege to and blessing to be able to participate in this spiritual, interspiritual dialogue, and I look forward to its continuing deepening and expansion of horizons together with the other participants. Our world is in a very troubled state with so much violence being perpetrated in all levels, and with animosity and ill will among different peoples, oftentimes even due to religious factors. This is why all the more so, those who belong to particular religious communities of the different traditions need to reach out to one another to work for mutual understanding and cooperation towards healing the wounds of our global society and towards a harmonious and peace, peaceful future among all people. So he had four minutes of that and he said, you can give your own uh, talk for the, rest, uh, for the rest of the eight minutes. So this is for me. As a Zen practitioner, I cannot help but also draw from the richness of two distinguished 
strict moral leaders, namely Yamada Roshi, who was my teacher's uh, teacher in Japan, and Bid Griffiths, an Englishman who converted to Catholicism and decided to live as Sanyasi in India the rest of his life. He lived in Shantivanam, and there is a place also here in the U.S. called the Forest of Peace, and it is located in Tulsa, where they welcome all faith traditions to practice in their ashram. So I've also been going there for the past 20 years or, or so. Yamada Rossi was asked several times if Catholics can practice meditation, and his response was, Zen is not a religion. Therefore, there is no reason why Christianity and Zazen, Siddha meditation, cannot coexist. My own teacher recalls his experience in Japan when the priests and nuns would celebrate the Eucharist and simultaneously the Buddhists would be chanting their sutras. Bid Griffiths, on the other hand, demonstrates a very clear understanding of the convergence of the different religions by using his five fingers of his hand, he would hold up his hand and point at the fingertips. I'm lost. Ah, where they are so different. Each finger then would represent the five religions, where Buddhism is the little finger and Christianity the thumb. Of course, we would have Hinduism, Islam, and Judaism. You will notice then that Buddhism is so far away from Christianity. But as you follow your fingers down to the palms, to the palm, the fingers merge into one space. As do all the religions, all converge onto the same sacred concept of the divine and how we all come forth from a common planet. That's a beautiful <laughs> image. In Zen practice, one of the fruits is what we call concentration, where an individual arrives at the point of unity of awareness or the point of stillness, wherein the subject-object dichotomy is overcome wherein everything is seen in clear light, just as it is. Ruben always hyphenates, hyphenates the word con and then dash centration to further explain that during Zen meditation, we are, lead, we are led to the deepening of one's being toward a deeper sense of integration, a greater sense of wholeness. I was raised a Catholic, and I've been practicing Zen for the past 23 years. At first, there was a struggle in, in embracing my practice, and I then realized that it was all because of my sense of thinking that made me separate from the rest, that I was better than the rest. As I continued to practice, there was that sense of realization wherein I was no longer other than the rest of my fellow sentient beings. It is in the process of embracing each other, rather than believing one is superior than the rest. When we embrace one another, we can coexist harmoniously and learn to accept that in the midst of our differences, we come from the same common root and can experience the divine in our unique chosen practice. So in closing, I'd like to go back to uh, Dr. Amitra's message. He says, I would like to invoke Sri Vivekananda, who though he lived more than a century ago, remains an inspirational figure for many of our 21st century contemporaries in a closing prayer. As the different streams have their sources in different places, all mingle the water in the sea. So, O Holy One, the different paths which men and women take through different tendencies 
carries no way of fear, crooked or straight, all lead to thee. Peace be with you and God's mercy and God's blessing. Thank you so much, Prana Prana. Congratulations to you and to the Vedanta Society for this wonderful accomplishment. And welcome, Mayor. Thank you for your beautiful city. And thank you for your words celebrating the diversity of the people in this city and celebrating their contributions and their accomplishments and actually, in fact, making this a wonderful city. I want to salute the Swamis who are here for your presentation for emphasizing that religion is the path, different path, to the same truth. And I want to salute you for emphasizing that what is very important for every religion is actually the work that's being done. What the work is the fruits of the religion is the fruit of the faith. People who know me know that I don't like to ever read. I always like to follow on what was said and present. And I think I'm going to do it today again. And I hope I will achieve what I wanted to achieve. I've been doing interfaith work for a very long time. I've done it before September 11. But I focused on it after September 11. Because of the vilification of Islam and Muslims, I wanted the world to know what are the teachings of Islam and who are the Muslims. And in today, in what's happening today, this is even more important. Because it is in our hand what will come out from the conflicts that are taking place. I remember after September 11, in the main cathedral in uh, Washington, D.C., when President Bush assembled the faith leaders from all over. I remember that the Muslim speaker recited a, word, a verse from the Qur'an which says, وَلَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَالْسَيِّئَةُ A bad deed is never equivalent to a good deed. Always repel bad deeds with good deeds. And then the one who might be your enemy turns to be your friend. I think if all of us as human beings recognize this, recognize that we did not make ourselves. We did not decide to be Asian or American or European or white or African American or brown. It is the Creator that sent us into this world and decided for us that this is who we are. And depending on the environment that we were in and how we were brought, we decided that this is going to be our ideology. This is what we are going to believe in. We are taking the time to know one another. Taking the time and stepping out of our comfort zone to listen to the other. Not hear the stereotype. Not be told about the other. Not, not use experts to come and tell us who the other is and what that faith teaches. But hearing from them speak gives you a total, total different view about what the faith is. I think today from the Swami presentation, 
from both of you, gentlemen. Your focus on how important it is, as you said, worship the living God by serving his people, by looking at the, the Bayer mentioned the homeless, thinking about the homeless, how can we help them, looking at the poor, looking at the uneducated. This is a major part of our faith. By recognizing the God in each one of us, that God made us in his image, that we are from the soul of God. In Islam, نفخ فيه من روحي. He breathed into the clay and made the first human being. Once we realize this, we realize that it's in our hand to make this a better world for everybody. We realize that it is our responsibility. When we see division, when we see enmity, when we see aggression, whether we then, let's start with our own community. We need to talk them out of using that kind of attitude. There's a hadith from the Prophet which says, support your brother, whether he is oppressed or whether he is the oppressor. They asked him, we understand how we support our brother when he is oppressed, we help him. But how do we support him when he is the oppressor? He told them, prevent him from loving his oppression on other people. This is the duty of every single one of us as a human being. If my community is doing something that is discriminatory, or if my community is thinking that we are superior to others, it's my duty to go back and show them the common bond and the common humanity among all of us. And show them, like the Swami said, that our religion is only one path to the same truth. I call upon you, I call upon as people of faith, as persons of faith, to please, let's work together to do this. Let's not have media or politicians or people with agendas bring enmity and fear and suspicion among us. If there is enmity and if there is fear and if there is suspicion, let us, every single one of us, open our doors and invite the others to come and to meet us and to meet one another. I am more than privileged, Brahma Prana, more than honored to have known you these few years. And I'm thankful to you for inviting me. And I invite every single one of you to come and meet Muslims like me. We come in all shapes, in all forms, we speak all languages, we come in all colors, but we are welcoming. And we would love to meet you and we would love you to know what Islam is, what true Islam is. Thank you very much. My Master's of Divinity is from SMU Perkins School of Theology. And I am very, although he had to leave, I'm very grateful that I took Dr. Hunt's class. Because of it, I came in the fall of 2009 to the first dialogue group here at the Vendanta Center. It was one of the assignments, and it began a remarkable journey to, for me. It's one that I am grateful to have been on, 
I am grateful to Brahma Prama, to the wisdom of the Swamis, and I too celebrate the journey that you have all been on and congratulate you on your center. <laughs> Among the many things that I have learned from my spiritual friendships here, I would like to mention three events. The first happened on my initial night here at the dialogue group. On the drive home, I reflected that if one were listening to an audio recording of the Christians and the members of Vendanta, and if you remove the names and the geographical references, there would be times in the conversation that you would not know whether it was a Christian speaking or a member of Vendanta. And I reflected that this is the spiritual journey that each person takes in their life. And like the Swami said, there are common questions we all ask. What is the meaning of my life? What is my purpose? What is next? What happens when we die? I feel the gift to me was understanding that there can be a shared spiritual journey among religions. The second gift was on the second meeting of the group. At the opening of the meeting, someone from the Christian group would say a prayer and someone from Vendanta would offer a meditation. And Dr. Hunt kind of looked at me and said, and you, Sherry, would you offer a prayer? For me, prayer is of great importance. And it's a deep spiritual practice for me. It is an essential part of my faith to pray for others. <clears throat> so I closed my eyes and I centered on my sacred space. And in that moment, it was as if the Vendantas were right there with me in that sacred space. And I do not still have words to explain what happened. But the gift was understanding that there can be a shared sacred space. And after this group ended, Brahma Prama and I talked about the benefits of interfaith dialogue. And I became a member of the Dallas Interspiritual Dialogue Group that meets here at the Vendanta Center. We've had four retreats so far together, and I have learned a great deal from each member of the group. And it was at one of these retreats that I made a remark about suffering. And I was thinking of my work at Baylor, which is a large, inner city, level one trauma center. And I was in my Christian head. And I made this remark about suffering. And Brahma Prama and Dr. Maria Havito very kindly and gently said there is another way to look at suffering. And out of my deep respect for both, I too paused and I started to read and study other religions' understanding of suffering. And that has been a gift to me personally as I work in the midst of much suffering at the hospital. In my work as a chaplain, I care deeply about each person 
that comes into my care, that I encounter at the hospital. But I understand people of other religions in a fuller way. I have a deeper respect and a fuller understanding because of the gift of the dialogue group. And I am very grateful for the spiritual friendships that I have formed over the years in this group. I am grateful for Brahma Prom's wisdom and for the many spiritual friendships that I have. And I thank each and every one of you for your support of this center that allows such important work done in the name of interspiritual dialogue. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be a part of this a very important event today. And I am deeply appreciative to Brahma Prada for uh, uh, having had the opportunity to participate in the interspiritual uh, dialogue group. Uh, the Jesus I know uh, would be delighted with this event today, and uh, he would embrace each of you and join in this celebration. Uh, I remember the time when over 50 years ago I decided it was important for me to try to understand what Jesus himself said and did as distinguished from how others interpreted his life and teachings. In my own beginning naive way, I wanted to develop my own understanding of who this Jesus was, his message, and how his actions embodied his own understanding of God. The quest contributed to my feeling a permission that I did not feel in my culture of origin to engage with people outside of my own religious family to get to know them and their faith in a personal way. And over the years, this quest at first included just Protestant Christians, and then there were Catholics, and then there were Orthodox Christians. And it was in that un engagement to understand and not to persuade others about my own views that I experienced a gradual transformation. It was my view of Jesus that was the anchor for me. Jesus saw every human being as a child of God without distinction. There was no other to Jesus, and he had a special feeling for those who despised or were mar marginalized or avoided by society. <clears throat> Jesus taught that the central commandment or purpose of life is to love God and love the neighbor without exception. If you love God, you cannot not love your neighbor. If you love your neighbor, you love God. Jesus walked out into his world each day simply willing to touch each individual he encountered in love and compassion and with the realization that God's healing and life energizing love and power were right there every moment. Jesus was a catalyst for making more manifest the love and power of God. Jesus taught and exemplified forgiveness, unbounded forgiveness. As he was dying on a cross, as if he were a common criminal, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He saw others not as sinners, but as children of God, lacking insight and life. And Jesus did not teach theology. He taught in symbols and analogies and parables that were intended to make people scratch their heads, upset their comfortable and exclusive religious ideas, and look beneath the surface of religious rites and pretensions to the divine, to their deeper spirituality. Now that is the Jesus that I gradually came to know that helped me to be more embracing of others, and this is the Jesus that would love being here today and supporting Vivekananda's call to religious harmony. My evolving understanding of my own faith moved me to a broader concept of the total human family. In 2009, I became involved in developing a program for North Haven United Methodist Church that offered monthly programs with presenters representing diverse religious perspectives, Christian and non-Christian, and sought to engage a religiously diverse audience. We wanted to create a space where individuals with different religious traditions could comfortably talk with each other about their views without fear of challenge or being proselytized. 
The program now called the Second Community seeks to create a multi-faith space where faith stories can be shared freely and fearlessly. The program has been increasingly effective in bringing people of diverse perspectives together to become engaged personally with each other in discussing the important topics of common interest. It was in 2009, in the first year of the program, that I received a call from Rama Pran, <coughs> asking me why there was not a Hindu on, on the program. Uh, soon she was on the program, and then again, <laughs> and over the years, she has been a good friend to me and my wife Patsy, uh, and uh, a friend of the second community. I have watched with great admiration since 2009 the way that the, the center here and the programs of the center have made such impressive uh, progress under the spiritual leadership of Rama Prana. I was very pleased when uh, Rama Prana contacted me to be a part of this small interfaith, uh, inter interspiritual dialogue group that she and Dr. Abito and Marina Rice Abito were organizing and invited me to be a part of it. I felt very inadequate to join the group, agreed, and it has been one of the most rewarding things that I've done in recent years. Participation in the group has added a dimension to my personal quest that could not have been met in other ways. The commitment of the group to deep listening and the emphasis on our respective individual spiritual practices have provided a rare stimulus for a broadened and deepened perspective of my own. Each member, member of the Interspiritual Dialogue Group has had an important impact on me. I got to know about Prana, I read the Bhagavad Gita, and I loved it ever since. Uh, I met King Yaja and Tazneen Mekong Ben Halim, and uh, decided to read the, uh, the Quran with, uh, with new eyes, and came to have very deep respect for sincere devotees to Islam. I met Radha Koretz and found a commonality in the basic spiritual aspirations of Judaism and Christianity, albeit in very different cultural contexts. Knowing Ruben and Maria Abito has motivated me to read the Dhammapada and Zen literature, and I resonate deeply with their blending of Christian and Buddhist Zen perspectives. Reverend Sherry Shanks has transmitted to me a wonderful example of Christian devotional perspective and practice and Brahma Prana has brought the deep spiritual insights of Vedanta of the Upanishads uh, to, to me. And so I am indebted to Brahma Prana and to my fellow interspiritual dialogue pilgrims on this path. In the opening remarks of the Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893, Vivekananda quoted a hymn from his boyhood. It's exactly the same quotation that, uh, that Helen uh, uh, read. Uh, and so it means that the, the same ideas that, it, that, that emerge in a great mind like that of Dr. Robin uh, Amitos can also emerge in a mind in, uh, well, lesser, a lesser person. Uh, and because of the importance of that statement, I'm going to read it again. As the different streams having their source in different places all mingle their waters in the sea, so, O oh Lord, the different paths which people take through different tendencies, various though they appear, crooked or straight, all lead to thee. The vision and clarity of the Vipananda and the consistency of the teachings of the Danta have been a great blessing to our culture, and I am deeply moved by remembering that today. Uh, the Interspiritual Dialogue Group, I think, that reflects the very best of Vipananda's vision about religious harmony. Bahuda Vedanti. Truth is one, sages call it by various names. This we find in the Rig Veda, the oldest living scripture of the world. Sri Ramakrishna practiced and lived that truth. He's a living parliament of religions. He practiced the various conflicting sects within Hinduism to their culmination. He practiced non dual Vedanta and lived thereafter six months in Nirvikalpa Samadhi a feat that is absolutely unheard of in the history of the world religions. He practiced Islam to its culmination. He had the vision of Christ. He understood the subtleties of Buddhist philosophy and recognized Buddha as a divine incarnation. He honored the Sikh in the Jain traditions. 
Sri Ramakrishna does proclaim from his own experience, as many people, so many paths. And that thread that runs through all religions is that non-dual experience. Its basis is the unity of existence. Swami Vivekananda is considered a pioneer of interfaith dialogue in America. He was his master's disciple, and therefore the recipient of the non-dual experience as well. In his Chicago address at the first full parliament of religions in 1893, he said, do I wish that the Christian would become Hindu? God forbid. Do I wish that the Hindu or Buddhist would become Christian? God forbid. But each must assimilate the spirit of the others and yet preserve his individuality and grow according to his own law of growth. Assimilate, yet preserve, grow. This raises the bar of interreligious dialogue to that of interspiritual dialogue. Real religion, after all, is interested in spirituality and spirituality alone. A spirituality which contains the whole universe, that sees everything with spiritual eyes, whether Buddhist, Christian, Jew, Hindu, or Muslim. A spirituality that transcends nation and is not the property of any one religion or ethnicity. It is based on character building alone, and it's uncovered in one's own heart and discovered in the hearts of others. Yes, Swami Vivekananda was a pioneer of interfaith dialogue and recognized as one of Smithsonian Institute's 29 most eminent foreign visitors for, quote, having left an indelible mark on America's spiritual development, unquote. So why is interspiritual dialogue so important? I'd like to share with you two perspectives, the societal and the personal. First, the societal perspective. Large-scale interreligious dialogue was first introduced in the West in the 1960s during what is called the Great Church Exodus, when two-thirds of the Christians and Jews left their churches, monasteries, and synagogues, disillusioned with organized religion. That is when the West turned to the East. Monsignor Vatican, the former, uh, the former Arch Archdiocese of Los Angeles, explained to me, Vedanta is considered the high church of Hinduism and was requested to enter Hindu-Catholic dialogue. What happened? What is and was the outgrowth of this deep, soul-searching dialogue? Several things. First, the revival of Christian and Jewish mysticism, because Hinduism is non-proselytizing or converting. A rebirth of the forgotten methods of meditation and prayer found in those two Abrahamic traditions a cross-pollinization of spiritual practices between East and West, as we, as we have heard today from the interspiritual dialoguers. An example is that, as was explained to me by one Catholic monk, there is an Eastern adept placed in many Catholic monasteries to this day. Also a spiritual life that was deepened. A Calvinist minister, Reverend Don, Postima, during his first year at the Snowmass Interspiritual Dialogue, explained to me and confessed to me that he came proud to the dialogue because he felt he was intellectually grounded in Christian theological perspective. But he left humbled and astonished at the level of experience in the participants from other traditions. And he took back with him Vedanta's Bhakti Yoga, a methodology of devotion to a personal God, and he learned to establish a relationship with Jesus that awakened his inner life. This is one example, just one, of how dialogue can inspire any sincere seeker to assimilate, preserve, and grow. Today in the Vedanta movement, we find committed Catholics, Protestants, Jews, even Muslims, 
who have assimilated Vivekananda's four yogas in order to preserve and grow their own root faith, whether in Krishna, Christ, Yahweh, Allah, God the Middle, the Ineffable. This is one of Vivekananda's great contributions to the world religions. And it's possible only because he inherited his master's own experience, that of non-dualism, the experience of every called samadhi, an experience of the unity of existence, the center at which the radii of all religious traditions meet. Now, from a personal standpoint, what does interspiritual dialogue do for me? It gives me a broader perspective a deeper understanding of the reality, the world, myself, a more informed spiritual practice, a greater understanding of my own tradition of Vedanta, and inspiration from the personal stories I hear. And this comes from osmosis and deep questions that arise when any one of us comes face to face with other faith traditions. One senior Swami of our order who has long engaged in interspiritual dialogue, explaining the inner search that comes from interspiritual dialogue. I quote, is there an experiential basis for the Christian belief in original sin developed by St. Paul? If so, where is the Vedantic parallel? If spiritual ignorance is a fact, how do other traditions treat it? If the reality of the world is ultimately negated in experience, saints in other traditions must have encountered it. But how? If the meditating mind goes through different stages, and if the human mind is common in its basic stru structure from person to person, then there must be at least some stages of development which are universally recognized in spite of the mindset. If so, what are they?" Unquote. Interspiritual dialogue is a lens that ignites such questions, that brings us face to face with our own tradition, a tradition that then becomes deeply considered, examined, and held up to the light of truth, not just inherited and widely followed. When this happens, our understanding broadens and our own spiritual conviction and dedication deepen. We become a blessing to ourselves and to others.